Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, it's a privilege to host um, the lecture organized by JICA organization and to be the host as the School of International Relations at Free University of Tbilisi. And it's honor to be here and to hear to this wonderful and amazing uh, lecturer, Professor Gitayo Kabat. First of all, let me introduce and just welcome Ambassador Mr. Yamamura, who will just give you a welcome speech, uh, the few words about the JICAS organization, about the lectures and the service that we have. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very pleased uh, to say a few words uh, in the beginning of uh, JICA Chair Lecture Series. Uh, uh, today we have a, a guest speaker, uh, Professor Shinichi Kitaoka. Uh, he came all the way from Japan uh, to meet you and uh, give you the, uh, the lecture. Um, uh, Japan and Georgia uh, uh, has been having a very good relationship based on shared values of democracy rule of law, human rights, and freedom. Uh, we celebrated last year, 30 year anniversary of our diplomatic relations. And uh, that's actually when this lecture series started uh, last uh, autumn. And um, um, JICA has been supporting Georgia's development from the very beginning of your independence. Uh, uh, this is because uh, of this shared values. Um, and its focus has always been uh, on human resources development because Japan lacks uh, rich natural resources. The human resources uh, is one of the very uh, few uh, elements that we had to, we can invest in our uh, modern nation process. And actually, uh, this lecture series has been uh, devoted to uh, uh, Japan's modernization experience from the middle of 19th century uh, uh, and we uh, more or less have now stable democracy and uh, the economic development and uh, of course we're not perfect Japan is not perfect so we had some successes but also some failures so the lessons we learned uh, is uh, something that may be uh, useful for developing nations like Georgia uh, so I would expect uh, from uh, audience, you, you young students, uh, future leaders of Georgia, uh, to find out what are the relevancy to Georgia's own development and current situation and the future. Uh, and um, uh, I personally were quite delighted to see today's lecture by Professor Kitaoka because uh, it was, it, of course, what, this lecture series is one of his uh, 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 brainchild uh, when he was a president of JICA uh, and it started, uh, this plan of doing this lecture series in Georgia started uh, two years ago, uh, if I may say so, uh, when I visited uh, uh, President Kitaoka uh, before I was about to leave for Georgia as an ambassador and uh, one of the discussions we had was uh, uh, Professor asked me uh, to consider uh, organizing this lecture in Tbilisi and uh, uh, I immediately uh, started discussion with Jack office here and thanks to uh, the very generous uh, arrangement by Free University uh, this lecture uh, started since last fall so that's why I'm personally uh, excited to see the discussions today and once again thank you very much uh, for coming to the, this lecture and especially the uh, faculty members of uh, uh, free University for uh, generous support and I look forward to the uh, fruitful discussions. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Ambassador and let me just thank you on behalf of Free University on the embassy support in developing the Japanese studies curriculum at our university. We do appreciate it very much and now let me introduce our host from the side of the School of International Relations, Mr. Alexandre Latsavidze. Sandro is our ambassador to Canada and Latin American countries and he's also the uh, permanent representative in International Civic uh, Avia Civil Avi Aviation Agency, just organization. And so Sandra gives here lectures at our School of International Relations in the uh, history of diplomacy and diplomatic service and the 
Of course, now he began to uh, give the lectures in uh, NATO security uh, course. So, Sandro, the floor is yours, and let me just give you some more to, to, to give us some words. Thank you, Sandro. Thank you, Tico. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Kitaoka Shinichi, the special advisor to the president of the Japan International Cooperation Agency and former president of JICA. Dr. Kitaoka Shinichi is going to talk to us about the recent developments of uh, the Japanese foreign policy. Dr. Kitaoka's specialty is modern Japanese politics and diplomacy. He obtained his BA in 1971 and his PhD in 1976, both from the University of Tokyo. He is Emeritus Professor of the University of Tokyo and Rikyo University. He has numerous books and articles, both in Japanese and English. Dr. Kitaoko Shinichi, before assuming the present post, was the president of JICA uh, from 2015 to 2022. Uh, his career includes president of the University of, of the International University of Japan in 2012-2015, uh, professor of National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, a professor of Graduate School for Law and Politics, the University of Tokyo, Ambassador Extraordinary Plenipotentiary, Deputy Permanent Representative of Japan to the United Nations from 2004 to 2006, and Professor of the College of Law and Politics, Rikyo University. Uh, I think I should stop here and uh, uh, ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Kitaoko Shinichi. Please. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I'd like to express my heartfelt thanks uh, to kind introduction and also to those people who worked very hard to make uh, my le lecture possible here, and also to the very kind introduction by uh, Masada Imamura. Thank you so much. Uh, I have been, uh, uh, yeah, I'm originally a uh, university professor, a uh, scholar, uh, specializing in modern Japanese politics and uh, diplomacy. Uh, in that sense, I'm a historian, also uh, at the same time political scientist. And also I was a, a practitioner of uh, Japan's uh, diplomacy. And also as a uh, leader of uh, JICA, I have been engaged with uh, uh, official development assistant uh, for many uh, years, uh, six and a half years. Uh, since I was a uh, uh, you know, university professor, I was aware of the uniqueness of Japan's uh, experience of modernization. Japan is the, the best example of the modernization from non-Western background. Uh, we have established a uh, you know, prosperous country, uh, peace-loving, uh, law-abiding, and then uh, without losing our identity. So I thought that uh, Japan can be the model uh, for many developing countries uh, for their development effort. Uh, of course, we made, uh, as we uh, uh, introduced by uh, Ambassador, we made many mistakes. But still, the mistakes can be the the hints, uh, what we should avoid. Uh, therefore, uh, from that idea, I started a program to invite uh, uh, students from uh, foreign countries, developing countries, to JICA and uh, to provide education in English about Japan's uh, modernization effort and post-war recovery effort and also today's ODA, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it was very well, uh, yeah, it was uh, uh, supported strongly by the late Prime Minister Abe, uh, with whom I had a close contact, then, uh, I, which was uh, very well received by many uh, developing countries. And uh, there came a lot of requests that they are willing to have a similar course in their countries uh, by, say, for example, King Abdullah of uh, Jordan or President Kagame of uh, uh, Rwanda. Uh, then I thought that, uh, oh, well, why not? Let's establish at least a small chair in at least one of the top universities in uh, those countries uh, where people can learn about uh, Japan's experience of modernization and how come Japan could ex uh, modernize without losing our identity. Uh, you know, essential importance of identity. You are the model. You know, Georgia has been surrounded by very big empires, but well, you survived uh, a few centuries, a thousand centuries, without losing your identity. Uh, that's a really a marvelous kind of thing. 
I have been uh, proud of Japan's history. But actually, after I came here for the first time in 2017, oh, oh, you are you are more, <laughs> you know, uh, the uh, Georgian people overseas can maintain their you know command of language and your religion, so forth. So I thought that that experience of my visit here uh, changed my policy to some extent. Let's support the Japanese people overseas for their maintenance of uh, you know, language command and so forth. Anyhow, uh, the, my uh, first visit in 2017 was so impressive to me. Therefore, I was very much willing to visit uh, this country again. And now I had the opportunity to give a talk in this JICA chair lecture. Uh, actually, JICA has uh, 100 offices overseas. And then, uh, so I thought that uh, let's establish 100 chairs in 100 countries. But I, I thought, that I found that it's, uh, it's very impossible because there are some countries where they have no university at all. Uh, therefore, I, I changed that a little bit. And my realistic goal is to establish 80 chairs in 80 countries. And now we have uh, come to uh, establish uh, uh, 64. So that my goal of 80 is uh, within our reach. Very soon we can make it in a year or so. But there are many types of uh, countries. But Georgia case is a kind of idea type because you have uh, already a program to study on Japan. And therefore, what we have to do is just to expand to cover the Japan's modern history and uh, Japan's ODA policy, blah, blah, blah. Uh, therefore, I respect the ownership of the, those countries. And then we, we should not push our effort to you. Uh, therefore, here is the ownership of uh, Georgian scholars, Georgian people. And then there's uh, excellent universities. So I'm delighted to be here to give a lecture. Uh, I was asked to speak about recent changes of Japan's foreign policy and security policy, which I will. Uh, because, you know, I have been in touch with the uh, uh, late Prime Minister Abe uh, quite closely. Uh, uh, my talk will be uh, uh, the Japan changes in security and foreign policy in the past 10 years or so, which are very important. And then I was uh, uh, luckily involved in those changes. But also, uh, before going to that topic, let me start with the uh, analysis of a very brief analysis of a pre-modern period. Okay, let me start. You know, uh, uh, there was an Edo period, uh, as I uh, wrote in my memo from uh, 1603 uh, to 1868. This is a very unique period. You know, in early Edo period, the probably Japan, Japan has been uh, Japan was the, the biggest military power in the world. Some specialists, uh, special military historians counted how many guns are owned in uh, many countries. And then the, the conclusion was that Japan was the biggest military power. Because there was a period of uh, 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 fighting of the nations uh, uh, for 100 years or so, from uh, uh, the end of the uh, 15th century to the end of the 16th century, the, there were many feudal laws fighting each other. Uh, but it was stopped by the war in 1600, and the new system was introduced by the uh, Tokugawa family, which is called as a Yedo period, because the capital was put in Yedo, which is today's Tokyo. Uh, at that time, there are a couple of uh, uh, estimations of the Japan's population. Uh, the, the minimum one was a 30 million population, or the maximum was a 70 million population, but something in between. Then uh, uh, Tokugawa family, Tokugawa shogunate, con just decided to close the door against the foreign countries, basically. You know, because the foreign countries are sources of confusion. Uh, they can uh, invade, uh, they can bring some weapons, to other feudal laws and so forth. They, they decided to close a door. And as a result, you know, uh, the peace prevailed for more than two centuries. Can you name any country, any, any period in which people could enjoy peace for more than two centuries? That's wonderful. 
in that period, you know, uh, within uh, 100 years, 120 years or so, the, there was a kind of a peace dividend. You know, first of all, the population grew to uh, uh, 31 million. Uh, and then uh, that's a quite rapid growth in the pre-modern history in all over the world. But after that, from 1721 to 1872, the population growth was very moderate or stagnated. So there was a remarkable progress of population and also economic activities in the first half of Yedo period. And then uh, there are many uh, things which we can call peace dividend. Uh, the best example was, of course, population growth and economic growth. But uh, most notably, I think, I'd like to point out the growth of uh, literacy. You know, in early Yedo period, the literacy rate was limited uh, to uh, uh, very few people, a uh, few percentage. But toward the end of Yedo period, uh, uh, the scholars tell that, uh, you know, roughly uh, 30, 40 percent of the adult male could read and write. And then uh, uh, women, which are a little bit handicapped uh, compared to men, could also write. Adult female could write uh, the 20 percent or 30 percent, which is probably one of the highest in the world at that time. You know, with this high high literacy rate, people can communicate in documents. You know, it's a very effective way of uh, uh, communication. Uh, also, there were the flourishing of uh, unique arts such as ukiyo-e, which had a strong impact on the Impressionist in France, and also kabuki, uh, there are other kind of things. Ukiyo-e and kabuki are still wonderful art. I, we are Japanese people are very much proud of that. One unique thing was that, they are the culture for the common people, middle class. You know, usually the art is sponsored by the king or aristocrats or so forth, but uh, Japan's art flourished by the support from middle class. In that sense, kabuki is uh, somewhat similar to Shakespeare, which was supported by middle class. But, you know, uh, every coin has both sides. There was a negative side of uh, uh, peace. Toward the end of Yedo period, Japan's military technology stagnated. So if you can compare the weapons, which was possessed by the people in the late Yedo period, you know, early 19th century, and then the weapons which are owned by the, uh, the samurai people in early uh, 17th century, they are roughly the same. What well, kind of uh, deterioration went on because of uh, inflation? Also, another was that uh, because Japan stopped uh, people from going out and coming in, therefore there was a, a decline of a navigation technology. In the 17th century, Japanese people could go to Southeast Asia rather freely, but it was uh, prohibited. Therefore, they had uh, been uh, engaged in a coastal navigation only. As a result, the, there were uh, Japan, which was one of the the, 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 the biggest military power was not a uh, very strong power toward the mid-19th centuries. Then there came a, a threat from Western countries. So they found that Japan was unable to compete with them. So there was a real danger of uh, being colonized. Uh, uh, you know, frankly speaking, you know, uh, there was no big power which was willing to uh, colonize Japan as a whole. But there was a many, a lot of possibility of, uh, you know, giving some territory, islands or port or so, like Hong Kong in China. Uh, and there were, therefore, there was a very uh, difficult time at that time. Then there was a change of the political system, which is called as a Meiji Restoration. Actually, we'd better call it Meiji Revolution, but either will do. Then uh, what they did was that within uh, several years, they abolished the feudal system and they established one centralized government under emperor. And also they abolished class system. The class system, tra traditional class system was a bushy uh, and also followed by farmers and uh, uh, the craftsmen and so forth, merchants. It was abolished and everyone has the same right 
uh, to participate in politics. Then, uh, uh, in short, it was a revolution of uh, you know, meritocracy, and the democratic revolution so that everyone can participate in politics, which took place within 10-15 uh, years from Meiji Restoration. That's why Japan could win a war against China uh, uh, within 27-28 uh, uh, years from the Meiji Restoration. Uh, China was believed to be a big country, uh, but actually uh, China was under the rule of a Manchus minority. Therefore, uh, there was no uh, unity among the people in China. So the, only the top people of uh, uh, China uh, fought with Japan. That's why Japan could win the war uh, relatively easily. And ten years after, as you know, there was a Russo-Japanese war in which yeah, we made an uh, you know, unbelievable victory over Russia. That's because of the, our national unity. In uh, Russia, the, uh, there was a strict distinction, uh, the uh, differences of status, you know, aristocrats versus common people. And there was no strong unity among them. That's why we could beat uh, Russia, which was considered to be one of the biggest military power at that time. But that was a you know, peak of uh, Japan's uh, unity. And since then, Japan made a uh, uh, you know, stagnation and then uh, going down. Uh, to go into the period of uh, militarism in the 1930s. You know, there are a couple of reasons. In short, first of all, the leaders uh, who are the founders of Meiji Nation passed away, became old. And then uh, they are very prudent in leading Japan in international society. But they were, you know, they passed away. And then they were uh, replaced by the political parties. And the many political parties were led by the uh, good leaders, but some of them are assassinated. And uh, they did not have a, a strong trust from the people. Because, you know, people believe that uh, party politics are very much corrupted. You know, that's true to some extent. So uh, uh, people's trust is a very important key to the uh, national unity. And then there was a, uh, you know, a Great Depression in 1929-29, and then in which, you know, Japan, uh, you know, the United States just established a high trade uh, barrier, and then that was a big damage to Japan. And then imagine, the Japan's GDP became just half, uh, in half a year or so. That was a big damage. Then uh, Japan was in a very difficult situation, which was, uh, uh, many people thought that, which was uh, broken by the military. The military uh, leaders uh, did a, a Manchuria incident in 1931. Then uh, they just uh, were successful in occupying uh, Manchukuo area uh, and they established Manchukuo, which was uh, uh, 3.5 bigger than Japan. Uh, the casualty was uh, 1,500 something like that. That was uh, believed to be a marvelous success, which was the start of the mistake, okay? And then they wanted to uh, invade more into China and eventually they began the war against the United States, which is an unbelievable uh, failure. And then Japan was defeated. Uh, now, uh, the, the, these are the part of uh, uh, introduction and uh, Japan uh, was, uh, as you know very well, was surrendered in August uh, 1945 and the occupation started by the United States. This is a starting point of my main talk today. <laughs> okay, sorry for a uh, long introduction. The uh, one important uh, characteristic was that, uh, you know, occupation in Japan was by the United States alone, unlike Germany. Then, uh, uh, what was the aim of uh, U.S. occupation? That's very clear. To make Japan a harmless country, uh, you know. And so uh, they thought that uh, Japan, uh, first of all, when they came to Japan, they just abolished, you know, a curriculum in uh, aviation studies in Tokyo University so that they cannot uh, produce any zero fighter anymore. And also they prohibited uh, judo, small, and then uh, kendo, 
so that、uh, any martial art was、uh, prohibited to some extent. And then the Kabuki, which I was speaking about, was、uh, also prohibited because they, they were thought of the product of the feudal mentality.、Uh, but anyhow, but actually, the、uh, uh, US changed their policy within a few years.、Uh, in 1948,、uh, they started the new policy to Japan and Germany. Faced with a threat from Soviet Russia and Japan, the United States wanted to、uh, promote Japan development and the German development so that they can be a good partner to fight against,、uh, to compete against Soviet Russia. But the, as a result of the、uh, first intention, original intention of making Japan a harmless country, they wrote a constitution.、Uh, Which is still、uh, continuing even today.、Uh, you know, writing a constitution under occupation is、uh, illegal in, the, in international law.、Uh, and also, it is a violation of a Potsdam Declaration. Therefore, they wrote a constitution and they pressed the Japanese government、uh, so that the government decided this、uh, constitution. And then the, the、uh, Threatening that if the Japanese government would not accept this constitution, then possibly the emperor must be brought to the international tribunal in Tokyo. By threatening this one, the Japanese government had to accept this one. Anyhow, the,、uh, the constitution has、uh, something, some good elements and some、uh, not so good elements.、Uh, you know, Article 9 is a very famous. Article in Japan, then、uh, in, uh, in order for accuracy, I just、uh, wrote down the Article 9. The first Article 9 consists of two parts. The first is aspiring sincerely to an international peace based on justice and order. The Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat of use of uh, uh, force as means of settling international. Disputes. This is, in essence, the same as the UN Charter. Uh, uh, also, this is a, uh, the revised version of the Kellogg Briand Pact of、uh, 1928. Therefore, all the countries, all the members of the United Nations have committed to this spirit, even Russia, you know, theoretically,、uh, which is not、uh, what they are doing. But the other part, the second half of the Article 9 is very unique and strange. In order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. The right of allegiance of the state will not be、uh, recognized. Part, part one is a universal. Part two is a unique or a strange.、Uh, I do not know any countries which has the same clause like this one. Uh, uh, it was okay at that time because Japan was under occupation. But uh, uh, Japan became independent again in 1952. As a sovereign country, we need some military forces to defend ourselves. But actually, it is clearly written here. And as usual in the case, the occupation power. Uh, made the constitution very difficult to change. You know, in order to change the constitution,、uh, the uh, uh, amendment has to be proposed by the two thirds majority of both houses and then to be ratified by the、uh, people's voting. Now, this is、uh, one of the very difficult systems. This is usually the case, as I said.、Uh, you can remember the UN Charter, which is very difficult to change. Because you know, victorious countries usually decide the international order so that the system cannot be changed very easily.、Uh, therefore, this is the case. The difficulty of a change of UN Charter is、uh, the same as the difficulty to change the Japan's constitution. And in this regard, Japan was divided into two camps. Germany was divided into two camps geographically, but、uh, Japan was not divided in. Uh, geography, but、uh, Japan is divided into in two camps internally. One camp is the majority people, 
represented by the uh, Liberal Democratic Party, they thought that uh, uh, it's uh, 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 important to have some military forces to defend ourselves. Therefore, they just uh, uh, decided to have a very flexible interpretation of Article 9, second half. The new interpretation was proposed in 1954 so that paragraph 2 does not prohibit the possession of minimum necessary forces because it is a natural right for any sovereign country. And then uh, the supreme organ which can give the authority to interpret is a supreme court in Japan. The supreme court accepted this interpretation and then uh, in 1959 Therefore, the official interpretation of Article 9, second half is that Japan can possess minimum necessary military power. But the Constitution uh, is uh, very clearly prohibiting the military forces. Uh, therefore, uh, people are split. And the uh, majority of people wanted to have uh, uh, good relations, particularly economic relations with the United States and also Western countries. And also, they know uh, it is important to have some minimum uh, military forces. On the other hand, minority people wanted to remain neutral between the uh, United States and the USSR. And also, they wanted to have no weapons. So their position was unarmed neutrality, which is very rare in the world. Uh, there are some countries with uh, armed neutrality, like uh, Switzerland, or some Nordic countries, but unarmed neutrality is uh, very difficult. Uh, but they did not change their view for many years until recent, though the number is uh, declining a little bit. Because, you know, United States was uh, very strong in East Asia, unlike in Europe. In Europe, the total military power of Warsaw Pact countries is uh, stronger in conventional weapons uh, against the uh, NATO. Uh, but on the other hand, in, uh, in the East, first of all, the population is very thin in the East, and east of uh, Ural, and the China was still uh, under the uh, developing stage. Uh, therefore, the United States was very strong. Therefore, Japan, Japanese didn't have, didn't have to worry about uh, the security. They could concentrate on economic development. And while so doing, they just forgot to think seriously about uh, security. Rather, in order to persuade the people, uh, they uh, just made uh, some compromises to the second camp, uh, which I believe unnecessary. A couple of uh, compromises is, first of all, certainly we will have to have uh, some military forces by the name of self-defense forces, but no, no, we will not dispatch this overseas. That's one compromise. That's why Japan was unable to join the uh, multilateral forces in Gulf War, which was supported uh, not only by the United States, but also by China and Russia at that time. Japan was unable to join it. And also Japan was unable to join any peacekeeping operations until 1992. In 1992, in a uh, not very perfect uh, system, uh, Japan started to join the peacekeeping operations in Cambodia. Uh, but still, the sending uh, the Japan's uh, uh, self-defense forces is uh, very difficult. But Japan is gradually expanding its activity, say, to the area of the uh, uh, Gulf of Aden in the uh, uh, Gulf area uh, to fight against, to monitor the activities of uh, pirates over there. Uh, but it was that the development is very slow. And secondly, uh, they adopted exclusively defense-oriented policy. Uh, they said to pursue the uh, second camp, oh, no, no, we will not uh, engage in uh, offensive activities. We will also engage in, in only defensive activities. Uh, well, certainly, but in, you can imagine any sports, for example, uh, tennis or volleyball or basketball. Is there any sports in which you have a uh, defense uh, role only? It's impossible, you know. In, as uh, uh, Grasovic pointed out, that 
There's no war, uh, no purely defensive war. Any war consists of many battles. In some battles you may lose and you have to get it back. Uh, therefore, some offensive role is necessary for any military. But uh, Japanese people just created a strange theory that、uh, offensive role should be、uh, showed out by the United States. We will engage in defensive role only. Theoretically,、uh, that, that may sound persuasive, but in reality, it's impossible. You know, because we, have, we are different countries.、Uh, then, uh, this is、uh, a strange division of labor theory con continued until recently. Then, uh, uh, Japan uh, adopted, uh, government adopted、uh, another compromise. s Uh, three principles of、uh, export of weapons. That was a limitation of the export of weapons, but in the 1960s, but in the 1970s, it expanded to、uh, substantial prohibition of export of weapons,、uh, saying that we will not become a, a you know, a merchant of death.、Uh, we will not engage in selling the weapons. Uh, that sounds beautiful, but still, because of that,、uh, Japan's military industry, which was once in a very high level before the war, had、uh, only the customer is the self defense forces. Therefore, because of this system, Japan's defense industry declined. You can compare this with other major countries. In most of major countries, the development of a military、uh, you know, industry was、uh, closely related. To the uh, uh, other economic activities, which is qu quite uh, uh, clear in the number four. You know, in many、uh, universities, national universities, military related study was prohibited, or they did not get、uh, enough support, budget support.、Uh, you know, in, in, in the United States, a lot of things are the outspins of、uh, defense studies. Then, Uh, you know, NASA was, a, for example, a very important example.、Uh, because the,、uh, I was a you know, university professor at the University of Tokyo, I wanted to change this, but、uh, it was very difficult to change.、Uh, as a taxpayer, taxpayer I don't、uh, like this system because, you know, security, defense of our country is very important. Why the universities do not engage in this kind of important study? I'm very much opposed to that. But still, the situation is still、uh, not very different. Now,、uh, number four compromise. Number, number five is that while Japan was uh, continuing uh, economic development until 1970s or 1980s,、uh, there was a criticism against the expanding、uh, budget, military budget,、uh, from the second camp. Who are loyal to the armed neutrality. And in order to respond to that, the government made another compromise. Oh, no, no, no. We will uh, uh, have a、uh, ceiling.、Uh, the budget, defense budget, has to be under 1% of GDP.、Uh, there's no theoretical foundation in it. But this is just half of the NATO standard, as you know.、Uh, this is uh, uh, the situation. But actually, on the other hand,、uh, while we are、uh, sticking to peace, but、uh, the, the international surroundings, not, surroundings are not, only, not always peaceful.、Uh, we have uh, uh, difficult issues on northern islands, which are、uh, occupied by、uh, Soviet Russia and now Russian、uh, Republic of Russia.、Uh, no, there's no comparison of your.、Uh, Case of、uh, Abhazia and South Ossetia. That, that's、uh, 20% of the total、uh, area, but we, we are, ours is much smaller. But still, that's very important for us. And also, North Korea started the development of、uh, new missiles and、uh, nuclear weapons since the end of the 1980s. And then they were successful in making the first nuclear test in 2006, and now they are. Able to shoot. Even the United States, theoretically,、uh, they have established the ICBM. 
that uh, recently, although uh, people are suffering from the poverty, they are developing nuclear weapons a lot. And then followed by the uh, Chinese expansion. Uh, we, were, uh, we cooperated very much uh, the, uh, to support Chinese development, but uh, they began to claim the uh, territorial claim over Senkaku Islands uh, in Eastern Chinese Sea. Uh, they have never made any territorial claim on those islands until 1970, but when there was a, a news that uh, uh, there can be a oil underneath, then they began the uh, claim over there. And also, uh, that was uh, followed by their expansion onto the South China Sea, uh, land filling over some islands, and then uh, you can see it uh, probably on the map. Yes. Uh, that was uh, uh, started in the 21st century, and then was accelerated, uh, threatening the neighboring countries like uh, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Vietnam, and other countries. And the Philippines was frustrated, and they, uh, they brought this issue into International Court of Arbitration, and then the judgment was that there's no theoretical ground for chi China. <coughs> uh, still, China declared this decision is uh, just a piece of paper. They just declared to uh, uh, neglect this one. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's becoming very difficult. Against this backdrop, finally uh, Japan's uh, policy, security policy, began to uh, change. And uh, particularly uh, remarkable changes uh, under late Prime Minister Abe in his second cabinet. He organized the first cabinet in 2006, but he had to resign because of illness, and he organized the second cabinet in uh, December 2012, and within 10 years there were uh, uh, remarkable development. First of all, in, uh, within one year, in December 2013, uh, uh, a National Security Council was established uh, to organize, the integrate the foreign policy and security policy. Uh, and also, uh, the National Security Secretariat was uh, established over there. And also, National Security Strategy was uh, written, adopted in, at the same time at the end of uh, 2013. I, I had the honor of uh, being part of this effort as a chairman of a council to make advice to him. Then, uh, uh, in uh, 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 2015, you know, uh, new peace and security law was enacted. You know, as you can remember, uh, the compromise number uh, two, there was a strange theoretical division of labor between Japan and the United States. Japan will engage in defense role only. Also, self-defense forces will work only within Japan. But what would happen if the United States vessels are, uh, which are engaged in activities to defend Japan in the vicinity of uh, Japan, and then if it is attacked by some other countries, then by a traditional interpretation, Japan was unable to join the United States in this situation. That was changed by the a change of interpretation of Article 9. I, was, I had been of the opinion that, you know, minimum necessary power is uh, allowed. You know, engagement in a uh, uh, collective right of self-defense is a part of minimum necessary. Uh, uh, that, that's an interpretation I proposed to him, and also he accepted this partially. That now, uh, it is possible for Japan to uh, fight together with the U.S. vessels if we are attacked in the vicinity of Japan. Not only the United States, uh, Australia uh, can be one of the uh, countries. Uh, you know, 
First of all, the collective right of self-defense is a weapon for the smaller countries. If you are a superpower, you don't need it. But small country、uh, needs some cooperation with other countries. Therefore, in order to get the support from other countries, you have to support other countries. This, this is a very easy theory. And、uh, this was finally accepted in 2015. And until then, you know, when they, Japan made some、uh, changes in security policy, there was some cynical criticism from、uh, Asian countries, from Southeast Asian countries.、Uh, but this time in 2015,、uh, there was all support. ASEAN countries, which are already threatened by Chinese expansion, they supported、uh, Japan's decision making to this one. Uh, uh, President Trump used to say that, you know, US Japan、uh, Security Alliance is very unfair. He said that we will defend Japan, but while we are、uh, combating with some other countries to defend Japan, Japanese people would not join us. They just watch our fighting on Sony television. It was true up until this one. But after this、uh, change of policy, it's not the case anymore. So that was a very important change of、uh, security policy, some adjustment of the, some compromise, which I mentioned already. I was also happy to be part of this effort under、uh, Prime Minister Abe. And then,、uh, After that, you know, this, the war in Ukraine gave a strong lesson to us. You have to fight to defend yourself if you are willing to get the support from other countries. That's very important. Also, I'd like to say that,、uh, you know, the unarmed uh, uh, neutrality theory was based on the idea that in the age of nuclear weapons, Building、uh, self defense forces with、uh, you know, conventional weapons will not work. But you can see, conventional weapons can work in uh, Ukraine. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, the, those uh, 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 utopian pacifists are losing their ground.、Uh, that's why I think that the Japanese people's mindset are changing. You know,、uh, Until recently, uh, uh, Japanese uh, uh, theory, security theory, was、uh, the biggest threat was、uh, North Korea. And then the uh, major uh, uh, countermeasure is、uh, missile defense. But it's impossible. Missile defense cannot be perfect. And missile defense is very costly.、Uh, therefore, uh, uh, conventional wisdom is to build up deterrence. You know, we will not start from Will not attack from us, but if you attack us, then we will make a counter attack to you. Therefore, do not attack us.、Uh, this is a conventional idea of、uh, deterrence. Now, Japan is、uh, finally changing to this conventional wisdom by adopting a counter strike capability, which was decided by the cabinet last year and then will be implemented with the budget、uh, this year, I hope. But, As a whole, you know, these are the just、uh, modest steps to a、uh, normal country.、Uh, this does not mean、uh, that Japan is becoming a big military power. We are surrounded by、uh, nuclear power like a Soviet Russia, and, uh, Russia uh, North Korea, and China. And then it is impossible to make an attack from us. You know, it's a suicide. We would not do that. Uh, therefore, these are the still the, uh, uh, some gradual and uh, uh, some modest, modest steps toward the、uh, normal or democratic country. Let me、uh, go to the area of、uh, change in、uh, foreign policy. Uh, uh, as you may know, that、uh, free and open Indo Pacific、uh, was a, a concept which、uh, Prime Minister Abe. Declared in、uh, 2016 in Nairobi, Kenya. At the very beginning, it was uh, uh, regarded as a counter strategy against the one belt, one way、uh, of a Chinese policy. But、uh, that's not the case. The free and open Indo Pacific is a 
prerequisite for Japan, Japan's uh, economic development, the Japan's economic recovery. Uh, we used to uh, engage in a trade with the European countries through Indian Ocean and also with the United States through Pacific Ocean. So we need it. And also, because of Japan's economic development toward Southeast Asia, those two nations are connected into one. Therefore, uh, we had the free and open Indo-Pacific concept, uh, the reality we had, but the uh, one belt, one way is a challenger to us. You may have heard uh, such uh, remarks by some Chinese leaders. Uh, uh, some of the leaders uh, said that uh, uh, to the United States leaders, uh, Pacific Ocean is big enough. Why don't we divide it into two? For the United States to be responsible for the eastern part of the Pacific Ocean, and we will be responsible for the stability of the western part. Where is the Japan is located in this idea? So basically, they are based on the idea of sphere of influence. Our idea is that the stability should be uh, guided by the international law. The freedom of navigation is the key to the uh, free uh, trade and also uh, solution of peaceful solution of the disputes. Uh, uh, therefore, as a result, uh, this concept of FOIP was strongly supported by President Trump, President Biden, and also G7 countries. And the many uh, European countries are willing to join this one. Uh, you know, this is one of the very few cases in which uh, Trump and Biden supported. It's very difficult. Uh, but free and open Indo-Pacific, FOIP, is not a geographical concept. It has its origin. The origin was a concept of arc of freedom and prosperity, which first Abe administration declared in 2007. The first statement was made in Uzbekistan. Uh, they just wanted to encourage the development of the former Soviet Russian republics, saying that in order to maintain the development, you have to have a system in which people can air their voice, people can participate in politics. Well, this is an idea to support the democratic uh, democratization of those countries. Therefore, it was the same message was sent to Eastern Europe and also to Guam area. Uh, therefore, this is based on uh, uh, the very freedom, uh, fundamental freedom. Uh, now, the uh, 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 many elements are, elements are necessary. Uh, I think that we have to work very hard to persuade Southeast Asian countries where China is making aggressive expansion onto them. If you ask them uh, the, in Southeast Asian countries, which country will be most influential in your future? Then uh, the answer number one is China, followed by the United States. But if you ask them, which country do you trust most? Japan is the number one. Therefore, if we, uh, you know, supported by the United States, uh, we can uh, get the support from uh, uh, those countries because no country is willing to be subordinate to any big power. So uh, I, I don't think we are competing our influence with China in that area. Rather, uh, we are trying to support the independence, prosperity, solidarity in Southeast Asia uh, from the uh, suppression from China. Uh, you know, Chinese, uh, uh, the difficulty of China may not be uh, felt in this area very strongly, but still in, in Asia it is uh, felt very strongly. Uh, they lent a lot of money to uh, developing countries, and then they, when they found that country is unable to pay it back, then they are willing to get some right. Uh, that is what happened in Sri Lanka, uh, in Hamban Tota. Uh, China got the right to use the, that port for 99 years. 
this is a new version of a Hong Kong, l i s t of Hong Kong to the British. So the China is now starting to、uh, engage in a new idea, new idea of、uh, imperialism. That can be found also in some part of Africa.、Uh, many countries are suffering from the difficulty of paying back the money because、uh, their lending is、uh, relatively with high interest.、Uh, the Japan's JICA、uh, loan is an、uh, uh, interest rate very really low,、uh, less than 1%. But in China, in the case of China, roughly 5% or so. No different from a、uh, uh, Uh, commercial activities. Why those leaders、uh, borrow money from China with that kind of a high interest rate? That's because of bribery. You know, therefore, uh, uh, we are trying to support the effort of transparency, budgetary transparency, financial transparency, so that people can understand what is the situation.、Uh, but anyhow, You know,、uh, we are not always competing with China.、Uh, we are happy to cooperate with China in some cases、uh, with some conditions, which was also declared by Prime Minister based on my advice.、Uh, China has to respect the transparency. And also, China has to、uh, the respect the environment.、Uh, this was an agreement made in.、Uh, Uh, G20 meeting in Osaka in 2019.、Uh, but anyhow,、uh, this is uh, 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 our relation with them. Then uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe was、uh, making another, a lot of uh, uh, approaches to many、uh, cases. But、uh, frankly speaking, Japan's foreign policy is、uh, paying too much attention to the United States. And also to G7 countries. But Japan's responsibility is、uh, to embrace the developing countries because Japan is the only one non Western country among G7. And also, Japan is the only one country which has experienced the、uh, developing countries. And we have suffered a lot、uh, before the war. You know, in the、uh, uh, Paris Peace Conference after World War I, Japan proposed、uh, a close uh, resolution that,、uh, about、uh, racial equality, which was rejected by the United States at that time. And then、uh, we are very much uh, uh, unsatisfied with that. But anyhow,、uh, we are in a situation that we can embrace, we can understand the feeling of the people. If we look at the situation of the resolution of the United Nations against Russian activities, you know,、uh, quite a few countries are abstained and also are non voting.、Uh, mainly they are from the、uh, Middle East、uh, and also Africa.、Uh, many of the Middle Eastern countries may be, be believing that, okay, Russian activities are wonderful,、uh, awful, but still, the United States also embedded into Iraq without an、uh, appropriate、uh, resolution of the Security Council in 2003. Also, many African countries believe that they had suffered from the colonial rule of Britain or France.、Uh, and also, the uh, uh, USSR supported their independence movement to some extent. So,、uh, it's not easy、uh, for, for the advanced countries to embrace those countries, but we can, we can do. That's our responsibility. The key role is shouldered by JICA as an organization to implement the official development assistance.、Uh, our ODA is not particularly big. Japan used to be the biggest donor in the 1990s, but、uh, not anymore、uh, because of、uh, economic stagnation. Japan's Uh, total amount of ODA is、uh, roughly number one in the United States, number two is Germany. We are competing with uh, France uh, for the third position. In terms of the you know, percentage against uh, uh, GDP, it's uh, uh, not very high. The、uh, target for the OECD is、uh, 0.7% of GDP, should be devoted into、uh, ODA. But we are uh, roughly the sun, half of this. Uh, 0.3%、uh, 
three, three, four, something like that. Okay, but still, what Jaica is relatively popular, well appreciated by those developing countries because of our approach. Uh, we don't think our assistance is a charity. You know, uh, many Western countries believe uh, that they have originally it rooted in the, the charity. Uh, we are committed to that, uh, the concept of human security, which is based on the idea that everyone has a, everyone has a right to live in dignity, uh, from, uh, free from uh, want, free from fear. Uh, therefore, it's our responsibility to support those people if the government is unable to support those people. Uh, that's why we are supported. We are uh, committed to the, uh, the dignity of those people by providing education, first of all, also uh, medical service, uh, public health, uh, which are the area uh, where we are concentrating. And also infrastructure is a very important because you know in some African countries the distance if because they do not have a appropriate infrastructure roads therefore they cannot bring their agriculture product to the port therefore it's very important and also infrastructure includes some uh, system of electricity with a bit of electricity they can communicate with the new york or whatever uh, uh, they have a right uh, to be supported on this area. That's why we call our organization Japan International Cooperation Agency. Unlike other countries, many European countries call it aid or assistance, but we call it uh, international cooperation. We are on an equal footing. We are on the same status. What we do is uh, let's sit down together uh, and, uh, in, around the table and let's discuss what will be best for your uh, development. Therefore, JICA's assistance or cooperation needs more time. It's uh, sometimes slow. But when we come to agreement, then the implementation can be very speedy. Uh, that's why relatively uh, JICA is well received. And then uh, I, I decided that, uh, uh, as I said, uh, you know, the education is important, uh, medical uh, health is important, infrastructure is important, and also agricultural development is also very important in any countries. These are what Japan concentrated in early age period. Japan had concentrated too much on rice production and the diversification was necessary. Uh, these are the efforts the Japanese government, Meiji government did that's why I thought this is partially why I uh, tried to establish, uh, you know, JICA chair so that you can share our experience uh, to today. Then uh, I have uh, uh, written uh, some uh, books on the Fukuzawa Yukichi, who was a uh, uh, founder of uh, intellectual founder of Meiji uh, Restoration, and also I have written a book on uh, Goto Shinpei, who was a uh, 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 originally, he was a doctor, turned to be an uh, uh, administrator in public health, and turned into a uh, colonizer. Uh, don't misunderstand. I'm against any colonialism. But still, he did a great job in Taiwan. Because Taiwan, in, in Taiwan, he was successful in eradicating tropical diseases, first of all. And he established many schools to accept the local people. And that's why Taiwan is very close to us even today. So, uh, uh, of course, there are mistakes. But still, uh, Japan's experience is worth sharing with uh, uh, our friendly uh, countries. And then by so doing, uh, uh, this year, Japan is a uh, uh, president of G7 countries. And uh, I, I hope that uh, Japan can fulfill this responsibility uh, toward uh, developing countries. And uh, you, you are the high end of the developing country, so you, you are uh, nearly uh, graduating from the status of being assisted. But you have a long tradition of a you know, wonderful cultural identity. And that though we are very far away, but still uh, we, there are many things that we can do uh, together. 
and I hope that uh, this JICA chair can be a very important instrument for this cooperation. Uh, how much, how long I have so, well, Anyhow, I'll stop here. Thank you very much for careful attention. Thank you very much for the very interesting uh, presentation. And now the floor is open, and please ask the questions. Uh, please uh, briefly introduce yourself, and then ask the questions, please. Um, hello, I'm an um, international Black Sea University student studying IR. Uh, I have a question regarding like what's the Japanese understanding of Sino-US relations. Uh, so today, United States and China are so-called strategic competitors, um, which means that the like, United States is criticizing Japan over unfair trade, uh, um, uh, intellectual property uh, theft, and so on and so on. But that's very similar to what was happening in 1980s between the Japanese and the US, uh, the cheap scandals and so on and so on. Uh, even the Asian crime was uh, on the rise. And it was the very same um, figures like Donald J. Trump criticizing Japan was uh, is also criticizing China now. So do you see any kind of similarities between them? And do the Japanese people have some sympathies towards the Chinese position today? And also, uh, I want to know what's, uh, what's your opinion on uh, Fukushima nuclear waste dump in the uh, uh, in the sea, because it upset not only uh, China and North Korea, but also uh, South Korea and uh, Taiwan, which are traditionally allies of Japan. Thank you. Well, well Japan suffered from a very difficult time uh, with the United States on trade disputes. Uh, at that time, Japan's export versus U.S. export to Japan was roughly two to one. But in recent time, the uh, Chinese export to the United States and the U.S. export to uh, China was a 6 to 1, something like that. It's uncomparable. And also, there's a, a competition. As you know, some criticism from the United States is based on their misunderstanding. You know, uh, they believed that the Japan's market was closed. But, uh, you know, there are many German cars are running in Japan. Only American automobiles are not running uh, because they did not do much enough effort. You know, now uh, where is uh, your wheel? You know, uh, we are uh, the automobiles are running on the different side from the United States. But anyhow, uh, the reason is that uh, you know uh, we have to accept the U.S. demand was that we are dependent on uh, security on the United States. Uh, therefore. Uh, 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 that's a di very difficult uh, situation. So we have uh, been asked many times by the Chinese people, uh, wha 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 do you have any wisdom <laughs> to respond to U.S. demand? But uh, it's uh, very difficult. Uh, but still, uh, China can, uh, you know, China is not relying on U.S. on their security. And also, Chinese market is very big. So uh, uh, the Though they are uh, criticizing China, but now uh, they are insisting that uh, some decoupling is necessary. But still, in reality, U.S. businesses are making money in Chinese market. It's, uh, it's not uh, competing very much. The real competition is on the security issue. Uh, you know, uh, China is expanding, uh, the, the, the developing nuclear weapons, and then now the uh, uh, power in Far East is, uh, you know, China is stronger than the United States. Uh, and that's uh, a thing which is threatening the United States more. Uh, then uh, 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 also the, uh, they thought that uh, uh, many ideas are stolen by Chinese people, you know, in universities. Uh, but now the driving force, the biggest drive, driving force of innovation was, uh, you know, coming from the United States. U.S. universities are the still the, uh, the excellent organizations, uh, so they are willing to stop it. But I think that the decoupling is very difficult for the United States. You know, uh, there has to be a patient uh, competition between two camps, which will benefit better, benefit the people better. 
and not going to the direct uh, confrontation. But uh, uh, whether or not we can get the support from the people, whether or not we can support uh, from uh, other countries or so forth. Uh, so far, China doesn't have many friends in the world. Uh, therefore, you know, uh, U.S. was uh, always slow to respond, uh, slow to find the difficulty. But if they found it, they sometimes react too much. That's uh, too much. But still, you know, uh, in the long run, uh, you know, uh, China is uh, now uh, facing with the aging society issue. The Chinese population will start to decrease. And uh, before China becomes uh, enough rich to provide welfare to the people. So the, uh, you, you should understand that the rhetoric is very much hawkish in the United States. But uh, competition without fighting is okay. You know, uh, there can be a competition. Oh, sorry, uh, the Fukushima and the others. Okay? You know, Fukushima was a terrible case. Uh, therefore, uh, the Japan was having a lot of difficulty. The uh, uh, contaminated water issue is a very di difficult issue. But uh, uh, AEIE is a you know, reliable organization, so uh, we will work together with the organization on, on this issue. Uh, hello, um, I'm Georgi Petrashvili, a graduate of uh, Faculty of International Relations at Free University of Tbilisi. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mr. Katoka, such an interesting uh, lecture. Uh, I have a, my question is related to both internal and external and foreign policy of Japan. Um, I have been researching the history and foreign policy of Japan for the past, uh, past few years. And one of the things that has been very interesting and strange for me was that even though Japan is one of the strongest diplomacies in the world, uh, the government of Japan has changed only twice in the last 70 years. The Liberal Democratic Party has been in power since 1950s. And I think only in, in the early 90s and late 2000s, uh, they lost government, and I, I think it was a left left leaning party who came in power. So I wonder, what is your personal opinion about the? Uh, I, I think the lackness of Japanese opposition to get in power, and how much how much is it related to Japanese foreign policy? How it can affect Japanese foreign policy? Thank you very much. There was a very important change of election system in 1994. Up until then, the uh, Japanese election system was a so-called multiple-seat constituency. Uh, that means, uh, you know, in one election district, there are several seats, three or four or five. You know, uh, therefore, there's a competition among those candidates. And then those uh, people from the utopian pacifism can get at least one seat or two in this system. The world, in order to maintain the power, uh, the candidates from liberal democratic parties have to compete each other in the same uh, district. Uh, because of that, uh, the LDP before 1994 was, uh, uh, in reality, it was a coalition of the factions. The faction is, factionalism was a very strong. Even if there's a very strong leader, then he can be pulled down by the uh, rival factions. So that's, that's why it was very difficult in Japan to maintain uh, uh, power for many years beyond two, three, four years. One exception was uh, uh, the Prime Minister Sato, which was supported by another faction led by Kishi, their brothers. Uh, therefore, uh, though those two factions are combined, so that's why he could maintain the power for seven years and so. It was changed in 1994. Uh, now, election system is based on the uh, ordinary single seat constituency. So one uh, member is elected from one seat. Uh, therefore, this is, uh, encourages more competition between the uh, parties. You have to have uh, uh, one candidate in one district. And then uh, the factionalism, the factions in LDP are still remaining, but they are winning. Uh, now, uh, the most important cleavage 
in the LDP politics is that whether you are close to the president or not. And that uh, if you are not close to the prime minister or president of LDP, you may not have a good appointment in the organization, in the government or in party. That's why uh, today's uh, president is very strong against other faction leaders. That's why Prime Minister Abe could maintain a long uh, period of administration. And then, uh, therefore, uh, but still, <clears throat> in this system, what we need is a competition between the parties. You know, the opposition party should, their, their po should change their position, discarding their utopian pacifism. And some of them are discarding their utopian pacifism. And they, they have to propose the realistic alternative policy to LDP. And then uh, there can be a more effective, realistic competition may take place. And then uh, uh, very few people have uh, understand, but actually uh, Prime Minister Abe's uh, leadership was made possible by the change of the political system in 1994. <laughs> はい、あの面白い講義にどうもありがとうございましたあの2つの質問があって最初はあの軍事的に関係勉強は禁止されたのについてあの未来の状態はどうなりますかどう思いますかあの何の,の何の状態ですか何が禁止されたの,あの勉強は禁止について勉強が軍隊的な勉強は禁止についてあ聞きたいのです意見が聞きたいのですそしてもう一つの質問は中国の帝国政策は将来日本に影響はどんなことに与えることができますかこれも聞きたかったんです Uh, so, I wanted to ask about the military related study that was prohibited in major universities and how will the situation change. I wanted to ask、uh, Kitaoka san's personal opinion and also can Chinese imperial policy affect Japan anyhow in the near future? Thank you. Yes, these are very important questions. First of all, the prohibition of the uh, uh, military related studies in major universities, like、uh, national universities. Was started in the 1950s or so.、Uh, the, actually, the United States wanted to ask some military studies in several universities, which was、uh, rejected by the scientists in those countries. The、uh, memory of the war was still very fresh at that time.、And、when it was once studied,、uh, once established, it was very difficult to change. Then,、uh, you know,、uh, in many universities, now the situation has changed a little bit. But for example, in Tokyo University, we have not accepted any、uh, guys from self defense forces as students. You know, it was rejected. You know,、uh, of course, I'm opposed to the study of aggression. But still, I think we have to make a research on how to defend our country. You know, defense is an important part. And,、uh, Uh, you know, the point is that、uh, defense and offense cannot be separated very clearly.、Uh, so the,、uh, we have to monitor whether or not this study is useful or dangerous or whatever. But、uh, total rejection of the military related research is wrong, I think.、Uh, and also,、uh, the point is that、uh, those、uh, decisions are made by the university professors by themselves. And then that was echoed by the government policy. The government did not challenge to those policies. They could challenge by proposing、uh, the research money. Why don't you come to、uh, do this study? But recently, the situation is changing. So, of course,、uh, you know,、uh, the many military related、uh, research can be dangerous. But today, the dual use is、uh, very common. So the, Uh, research on uh, uh, civilian life can be used for、uh, military purpose. So, the, what's important is how to use them. The、uh, fundamental prohibition is not a very productive way、uh, to promote the scientist level. So the second issue,、uh, Chinese expansion, is、uh, you know,、uh, there are a couple of things. First of all,、uh, we are very much sympathetic to the、uh, Chinese people about their lack of、uh, freedom. Uh, you know, human beings have、uh, three fundamental 
desires, uh, security, and wealth, and freedom. I'd like to be free, you know. The, but in China, it is very much uh, restricted. Uh, a few years ago, several years ago, uh, a notable, uh, well-known professor of Hokkaido University made a visit to China and was arrested when he bought some books in a bookshop. And he was accepted, suspected as a spy. Then was not able to be returned to Japan for several months. Since then, the academic exchange was uh, suspended. That's very pity. A few years ago, in 2018, there was a uh, a big symposium on Meiji Restoration in Nanhai University in Tenchin. That was uh, very uh, successful. I was invited as a main keynote speaker over there. Meiji Restoration is a safe topic, okay? And then it's okay until uh, 1911, okay? After that, uh, you know, the study of Japan can be, you know, uh, uh, dangerous. Then, uh, I believe that uh, uh, freedom of speech, academic freedom, can be the basis of the freedom, free society. And then I uh, really don't like their system. Look at Hong Kong, right? They lost the freedom. And we, I have many friends in China. I have many former students in China, but I cannot communicate with them because uh, all the messages are monitored by the government. Uh, oh, only when they come to Japan, we can enjoy talking freely. Uh, uh, therefore, the lack of freedom is uh, something I fundamentally dislike. Uh, also, the, the danger of a dictatorship. You know, dictators can make mistakes. And under the dictatorship, it's very difficult to change, change the system. You know, we have just seen the, the failure of uh, Putin. He had a bad advice from his subordinate so that uh, we could destroy Ukraine very shortly, which was wrong. And then uh, uh, in the dictatorship, subordinate people uh, cannot provide uh, any information that may displease the top leader. And then they, that means that the dictator can be surrounded by those toady people alone. That's dangerous. Uh, therefore, we have to say uh, we have to make our, our opinion that uh, you are making uh, engaged in the de dangerous activities. Uh, in the past, I was a member of the Japan-China uh, 21st uh, Commission for the Friendship for Soul, uh, in which we can discuss freely anything. And as uh, I was uh, a chairman of the Japanese team in Japan-China Joint Study of History, in which we can discuss freely anything. But now it's very difficult. Uh, and then uh, they, are, they should be guided uh, appropriately. And also look at the education. Uh, in China, they do not teach the uh, Great Reap at all. They teach cultural revolution to some extent, but it is becoming smaller and smaller. And uh, their coverage of ten number incident is becoming smaller and smaller. And then uh, that's dangerous. And also in uh, uh, Xinjiang Uyghur, uh, they do not allow uh, uh, the Uyghur people to teach uh, the language in elementary education. Uh, that's not an uh, appropriate, appropriate way. And then uh, they uh, used to say that they, can, they are willing to integrate Taiwan. Uh, they will not avoid the use of uh, uh, power. But uh, in Taiwan, there are 23 million people are living under the government which they selected. No one has the power to destroy this system. Uh, from this fundamental principle, I am very much concerned about the dictatorship in China. Uh, Luca Dumashvili, IR student in Free University, Tbilisi. First of all, thank you for coming. Uh, hopefully, mm, our two countries will be able to exchange goods and services, and with the help of Chika, who our finest citizens of both countries will be able to work together for a better future. 
As we know, Russia is uh, committing an illegal offensive war, an invasion. Regardless of how it ends, uh, I think it is clear that uh, they have become less trustworthy in the international realm. And uh, uh, as you've already mentioned, China um, is another case, but not always confrontational. In fact, Japan and China are cooperative in some instances, which is good as long as nobody is physically harmed. Uh, so, uh, Europe, uh, uh, European Union, which we aspire to um, be a member one day, and uh, f Far Eastern Asia, Japan, China, South Korea, etc., uh, are going to have uh, very serious diplomatic and economic relations in the future, even more frequent than it is today, I believe. And... Uh, uh, Russia is at war, uh, future uncertain. The Middle East has basically always been at war with, with each other, and uh, Georgia is basically at the center. And uh, what I would like to know is, uh, will we be able to uh, gain something from this situation? And uh, if uh, so, how, what should we do? How can we do it? The Georgia can be a model, you know. You are uh, twenty percent of your territory is occupied by Russia, uh, but uh, you need Russia as a trade partner, and also the tourists from uh, Russia is very important source of income for your country. So we would better avoid any confrontation. Uh, we cannot make an open compromise to them, but we have to accept the situation and uh, to live in coexistence. And uh, that's the same for Japan with China. Uh, we don't like their system very much, but uh, it's better than a uh, real, real war. <laughs> that we don't like uh, 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 to get into the war. Uh, the same for Southeast Asian countries. And then, But uh, uh, nowadays, uh, because the uh, Chinese uh, approaches are very you know, high-handed approach. Therefore, uh, uh, their approach to many countries are not very successful. Uh, are there enough friends in, in over there? And also China realized the situation to some extent. Therefore, uh, uh, Chinese proposal on Ukraine is uh, something I cannot understand well. But still, one thing is very clear. Uh, they don't like to be seen as a close friend to Russia. But at the time, they don't like to lose Russia as a partner. So oh, they are in a very difficult situation. Uh, therefore, what we can do is uh, to raise the public opinion in the world uh, so that that kind of uh, uh, the naked invasion should not be repeated anymore. Uh, it may take time, but you can show the model case that you are in a, a strategic patience against Russia. And then uh, you don't want to uh, open the war against Russia. Good evening, sir. Mm, I'm pleasured. To, uh, it's my honor to be here. Uh, I'm a student of this university. I study international relations. Mm, I would like to hear your opinion on the mutual defense agreement between uh, the United Kingdom and Japan, which was signed, I think, a month ago mm, in January 11th which uh, basically gives huge amount of capabilities to uh, defensive capabilities to both parties but especially to japan as it enables the united kingdom to provide support you know, military support if needed uh, i would like to know how important this agreement is for for japan for japan security and how uh, significant can it be in the future to maintain the stability in this region as it is surrounded by these titans. Thank you. Well, the, uh, uh, the, there are many kinds of uh, alliance, for example. The classic type of alliance is that if you are attacked by some countries, we will join you to uh, make counterattack against those countries. The mutual uh, assistance. But there are uh, lower level of uh, 
uh, agreement, which is close to alliance, but not so much alliance. Uh, for example, we can share the information about that. For example, you know, uh, with the Southeast Asian countries, you know, they, uh, the, from China, there are many uh, ships coming into Senkaku area to the Eastern China Sea. But on the other hand, they send also a lot of ships to the South China Sea. And we can share the information about the entry of those ships together. Uh, that will help each other. And then also, uh, as my, I might have told you, Japan is assisting the Philippines and Indonesia uh, in uh, constructing a uh, coast good. The uh, Philippines has uh, 7,000 islands, and Indonesia has uh, roughly twice. And uh, they need a uh, coast guard to fight against pirates and the illegal trafficking. But this is a, uh, you know, maritime police, which is a part of, uh, you know, uh, uh, police activities, which is not military, but still, the having coast guard can be, uh, can work as uh, some kind of deterrence against them. Uh, sharing information and also uh, uh, sharing the, uh, uh, there's a kind of uh, uh, thing, AXA, agreement concerning service and so forth. You know, we can share if we have enough bullets and then we can lend them something. Uh, these kind of things are important. Uh, therefore, uh, there is a, we could say that there's a low level of agreement, which is not the alliance, uh, but which is uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, similar in uh, uh, essential uh, cooperation. The information sharing is very important. You know, in uh, where we fought, fought the war with Russia, the U.S. did not, the uh, U.K. did not come to help us in fighting, but they provided very important information to us, uh, and they just try to block the, uh, you know, Russian fleet uh, from going to uh, uh, Suez Canal. And then that's why they had to go uh, around Africa. And then that made the uh, sailors uh, exhausted. And then those kind of things, uh, cooperation are uh, effective to some extent. Uh, we needed at that time a lot more and more, uh, you know, warships. And then uh, at that time, uh, United Kingdom, Great Britain was producing a lot of uh, warships. And then uh, some of them are are uh, being made uh, by the order from Argentine. And then uh, once they found that Argentine did not need any uh, vessels more, and then they just uh, told us, Japanese people, that uh, there's a possibility of uh, uh, a purchase of uh, vessels uh, which had been already ordered by Argentine. Then Japan did it immediately. Uh, that was very important in the battle of the Tsushima. Uh, uh, therefore, a mutual cooperation is very important. Hello, oh, my name is Sukha Bramshvili. I am in the ninth grade school student. So my question is, uh, during the lecture you said that uh, China is not a you know, competitor for Japan in uh, the region, but if China tries to dominate the Indo-Pacific region, uh, will it cause do you think that it will cause um, ideological war between Japan and China? Thank you. Well, in ideological war, uh, we will not be defeated at all. But if they uh, decided to engage in a real war, that's a very difficult choice. But, you know, uh, as I was saying, China uh, is a cautious country in military activities. They will not start fighting unless they believe that they can win the war uh, in a short period of time with, uh, without much uh, uh, sacrifice. Uh, therefore, the best way uh, to continue peace is uh, to pre prepare well, to raise the level of deterrence. And uh, in the area of uh, ideological war, we are confident uh, because we are based on uh, good principles of uh, freedom of discussion, blah, blah, blah. And then, uh, you know, uh, certainly Chinese military power is uh, bigger than uh, U.S. 
Japan, Taiwan combined as of now. But in order to occupy, for example, uh, they have to have uh, three times more military power uh, than the defenders. You know, offender, uh, the offense side has to have uh, more power. And also, uh, you know, we have been, we are supported by the United States also on the south and western area. We have a close friend by the name of India. Uh, therefore, uh, you know, that's not easy for them to make. Uh, uh, they can, uh, in, in many simulations uh, on the fighting around Taiwan, uh, we have to uh, uh, face a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, damages. But still, as a result, uh, China cannot get Taiwan. That's a result of the, you know, uh, the uh, many simulations. But because of the, you know, agreement between Russia and the uh, United States, the uh, United States does not have an uh, intermediate nuclear power in the vicinity of Asia. Uh, and uh, China is uh, more advanced in that area. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the politics and diplomacy of superpower cannot be changed easily from outside. They can be changed from within. So, uh, you know, uh, Chinese people are not necessarily very happy with today's system. Uh, Chinese leaders have to satisfy the people by uh, promising the economic development. But if development goes into the stagnation, then uh, anything can take place in China. Uh, in that sense, I think uh, the Xi Jinping's decision to go into the third term is a very bad mistake. You know, they had been in the system of uh, uh, going into two terms and to be, to be changed by a new leader. This is a good opportunity to, to change the policy. But uh, this is, uh, if this continues eternally, it's very difficult to change the policy, mistaken policy. Putin is uh, exactly the case. Uh, in, in reality, uh, there's a, a something similar to election, but still, you know, it's a kind of uh, eternal uh, dictatorship, which is uh, very dangerous in the sense that they cannot change the policy. Hello, my name is Lik. I'm a student of international relations at uh, Plex International University. Thanks for the lecture. First of all, it was very interesting. Uh, it is kind of my question is kind of continuation what was previously stated. So Japan and China had some some kind of um, like um, policy that called um, politics and hot economic. Uh, and uh, since like normalization of uh, Japan, your China's relations since like 1972, um, the countries become like very closely economically tied. And Japan has been trade partner to China uh, since then. And it becomes even more and more. But um, I was wondering what's your opinion regarding, for example, if Ch uh, Japan, China tries to provocate, in a sense, of Kuril Islands or even Taiwan or this like a nine dash line sea. Would it be affected to the this economic policy of Jap Japan, in a sense? And I have very small question about the uh, another topic as well. Um, you the article after the first interpretation of the Article Nine that, uh, for example, the Japan could have a defense defensive port forces. Um, it got me a question like how to differentiate what can be like offensive and what, what can be, for example, defensive when it comes to military uh, and how it should be like how it's in line with the um, the constitution and in part in pair with the, for example, what US has been. So it was like, a, is the um, Japan in a way of becoming kind of a normal state and changing the shift from the U.S. security umbrella, or it is most most likely to stay in the shape how it is now. Thank you. Well, Japan is becoming uh, or trying to become a normal, peace-loving country. That's it. Uh, not more than that. You know, uh, defense and offense can be uh, differentiated very clearly. We will not start fighting from us, okay, unless we are attacked. Uh, that's it. And then, uh, but in the case of uh, Taiwan, uh, you know, this touches upon the fundamental principle of uh, international society today. We should not change the status quo. Uh, you know, uh, how come it is allowed to invade into the countries uh, where 23 million people are living peacefully uh, without, uh, they do not threat uh, uh, China at all. Uh, only 
the thing is that uh, Chinese leaders are willing to integrate it into uh, China. But historically, Taiwan is not a part of uh, uh, China. Uh, you know, in the, the Taiwan came to be under the uh, uh, rule of uh, mainland power in early 17th centuries. It was only you know, uh, controlled. They it control the western coast of Taiwan, the uh, mid, the mountainous area and the east coast were uh, you know area where indigenous people are living. Uh, they are uh, the people from Malay, and then uh, they did not occupy the total uh, island of Taiwan uh, until nineteenth uh, century, and then uh, uh, so their argument that the Taiwan is an integral part of China is wrong. So uh, uh, if they do not agree with that, then why don't, don't, don't we start an uh, academic discussion about the historical nature of uh, Taiwan or anything like that? But even if they are from the same uh, origin, uh, is it allowed to make a frontal aggression to that? You know, uh, you know the, uh, Austria is a you know, country where German people are living, uh, but a different country. Uh, Therefore, uh, I, uh, again, I come back. I'd like to come back to the very basic principle of uh, no change of uh, uh, status quo by power. You know, if there are disputes, international disputes, those disputes have to be solved by mediation or arbitration or diplomacy or whatever, not by force, which was broken by Russia. And then uh, I, I really hope that Russia will not be successful in the long run, and then uh, certainly uh, Russia will suffer uh, very great damage in the long run, uh, they will suffer. They are losing their uh, best and brightest people. Many of them are coming to Georgia, I believe, and that, uh, you know, uh, they will have to pay the price. And I, I'm very sorry about uh, that for Russian people. Russian people are uh, very good people. They have created wonderful art, literature and so forth. The same in China. I, the Chinese classics are the, the, one of the important parts of our basic uh, uh, education. But what we do not like is uh, uh, today's politics and diplomacy of Chinese leadership. That's it. Okay. Two more questions and we're done. Okay, now the young lady is here and another... Hello, uh, my name is Lana Gordanze. I'm the senior year student of international relations in this university, and I want to thank you for an interesting lectures. Um, there are raised concerns um, in Japan about the uh, feasibility of self-defense forces uh, to shoot down the spy balloons uh, that we heard that entered Japan uh, recently and also in 2020, uh, 2021 and 2020. Uh, would you consider those spy, uh, spy balloons um, Chinese spy balloons a threat? And if so, do you think that the self-defense forces should adopt, adopt a more convenient procedure to get the permission to shoot down those um, spy balloons? Thank you. In, uh, in cyber warfare, Japan is very much behind. Because, you know, it's, uh, it's very impossible to separate offense and defense in cyber warfare. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, the, uh, the universities with which I have been affiliated have been uh, uh, attacked by cyber warfare uh, many times. And then, uh, you know, the offense and defense can take place at the same time, you know. Therefore, this is also uh, you're bound by the, the, uh, what I call the compromise to persuade the people. We should engage in defense only. So defense only is impossible in cyber warfare. Uh, but as a whole, Japan has a huge potential in scientific area. So if we concentrate on our effort uh, to promote our cyber warfare, cyber technology, then Japan can make a kind of catch up. The, Hello, uh, oh, you're answering, sorry. Uh, sorry, uh, the, the balloon is, uh, you know, the balloon issue is, uh, you know, it's, it's a really uh, very difficult to understand what it really is. 
some people say that it is to get more detailed information from the ground. But on the other hand, uh, most of the information is uh, uh, already available through the satellite. So I don't know uh, what re it really means. So uh, uh, separate specialists are, sep uh, are divided on this issue. So I cannot tell uh, with confidence on this. Please. Hello again. Uh, I'm a student of Free University in Tbilisi, Faculty of International Relations, and thank you for being here and giving us such an informative lecture. My question is more technical rather than about uh, foreign policy of uh, Japan. I wanted to use this opportunity to ask about JICA's future plans in Georgia and uh, how students who are not specializing in Japanese studies uh, cooperate with the organization and use this chance of JICA being present in Georgia. Thank you. You know, uh, major uh, countries have their, you know, programs in many foreign countries. Uh, France has it, and Germany has it. Uh, needless to say, the United States, UK has it. Compared to those countries, Japan has been uh, uh, not very much active in uh, promoting Japan's culture and so forth. Uh, in the uh, 90, early 1990s, when Japan's economy was uh, uh, very much booming, Japan did uh, some effort to promote uh, uh, the study of Japanese language and Japan studies in various countries, which did not succeed very much. Because, you know, even if you study Japanese language to some extent, but still there are very little to read after that. But now, nowadays, you, you have YouTube and you have uh, uh, manga, uh, cartoons, and so forth. So uh, this is a, a very good uh, opportunity to uh, promote the study of uh, uh, the culture. And then, as I said, I have been uh, promoting the, uh, the sharing the uh, experience of uh, modernization. Still, I believe that culture is the core of identity, you know, and I respect Georgia because you, you are the country of uh, great poets, you know. That's very important. You know, uh, in the near future, we are trying to send a uh, uh, Irish scholar uh, to come to give a lecture here. Uh, his name is Peter McMillan, and he's a good translator of a Japanese uh, poem into English. And he's now engaged in a, a translation of Man Yoshu. Man Yoshu is a, a collection of 4,500 poems, which was completed in the 8th century. And uh, uh, that's a kind of miraculous uh, uh, achievement in uh, literacy, you know, it includes the poems uh, uh, created by the emperor, empress, and also the commoners are included. And also uh, the collections of the poems can be enjoyed by the uh, today's uh, junior high school student with some effort. Uh, I was very much proud of that. But actually you have uh, the same tradition here. You can enjoy the classic poem by yourself. Uh, therefore, uh, in other countries, I insist on the importance of the, uh, uh, the experience of uh, development. But in Georgia, we can go beyond that to touch up on the core of identity uh, to go to culture. I'd like to thank Kitaoka-san for the remarkable lecture and also I'd like to thank the audience for very interesting questions. Once again, thank you very much. Don't worry,